the subject matter is absolutely fascinating. The plague that raged through Europe in the 14th century changed just about every single thing about medieval society, and indeed, in large measure, it produced the modern world we live in today. In order to convey the impact of the plague on the medieval world, I want to zoom in, as it were, to one particular moment in time and one particular place. Florence, Italy, in late January, 1348. If you're a Florentine in the mid 14th century, things are pretty good. Your society is stable and economically sound. There is complex social and political infrastructure. The city is wealthy because of its extensive trade networks. It's governed by a more or less representative body of leaders who take it seriously to regulate the safety and well being of its citizens. The city itself is a leading patron of the arts with some of the greatest artistic minds the world has ever known, commissioned by city fathers to beautify public spaces and buildings like the Guildhall. The news in Florence in late January 1348 would have been preoccupied with some horrific stories coming out of Sicily. Some mystery illness was apparently wreaking havoc there. But that was far away from daily life in happy, prosperous Florence. And then a few people got sick. No real cause for alarm. But by mid-February, more and more people were getting very sick and dying. But unlike other illnesses that this city had experienced over the centuries of its history, this outbreak didn't burn itself out or slow down. It got worse. People dropped dead in the streets or died in their houses, and no one knew they had died because there was no one left alive to notice. Beautiful public spaces that in mid-January had been places to meet friends and have a conversation were open, stinking mass graves by March. Practically overnight, Florence had gone from being a jewel of a city to a charnel house. And as we'll see over the course of the next 24 lectures, the experience of Florence was going to be far from unique during the years the Black Death swept through the medieval world. I must admit, I did at times find myself overwhelmed by the horrors of the plague, especially when it came to reading first-person accounts and letters but as I'm sure every one of you listening and watching right now feels, it is worth it, and indeed it's critical, that we study the past, including the parts that make us uncomfortable or depressed, so that we can better understand our present and prepare for the future. As I have said on numerous occasions, one thing I love about studying the Middle Ages is that it often feels utterly foreign and alien. And then, in the next moment, a character in a medieval story or the writer of a chronicle of the Middle Ages says or does something that is completely recognizable and familiar. And it reminds me that people then and people now are more alike than not, even if our settings or our contexts then and now are radically different. But when it comes to the Black Death, it often becomes difficult to see those connections and similarities because the horror of that experience was unlike anything that had ever occurred in living memory. And people's reactions were understandably coming from a place of sheer terror and despair. Consider this eyewitness account of Giovanni Boccaccio, writer of the Decameron, who described how every morning in the towns and cities of Italy, the corpses of those who had died in the night would be placed out into the street. And eventually, funeral beers, sometimes nothing more than a rough board, would go through the town to collect them. Quote, it was by no means rare for more than one of these beers to be seen with two or three bodies upon it at a time. Many were seen to contain a husband and wife, two or three brothers and sisters, 
a father and son, and times without number, it happened that two priests would be on their way to bury someone, only to find bearers carrying three or four additional biers that would fall in behind them. Such was the multitude of corpses that there was not sufficient consecrated ground for them to be buried in. So when all the graves were full, huge trenches were excavated in the churchyards into which new arrivals were placed in their hundreds, stowed tier upon tier like ship's cargo, each layer of corpses being covered over with a thin layer of soil till the trench was filled to the top." End quote. To many, it seemed as if the end of the world was surely at hand. Indeed, one chronicler leaving a blank space at the end of his history noted that he did so in case anyone should be left alive who might wish to make a record of events that had transpired. It's clear that leaving this space was a desperate, defiant action of optimism because it didn't seem likely that anyone would survive. An event with such staggering effects is clearly worthy of greater understanding. And in this and the next 23 lectures, we're going to try and do just that. So let's get to it, the Black Death. Okay, right off the bat here, let's deal with two common misconceptions. First of all, it is not called the Black Death because parts of the bodies of people who were infected turned black. Most people who have a passing knowledge on the subject know that the plague was often called the bubonic plague because in one form it produced large lumps or buboes around the lymph nodes, so at the groin or armpit. And people seem to have assumed that the term Black Death refers to the color of those buboes. Nope. The term Black Death is used to suggest the horror of the epidemic, not the color of its symptoms. It was a dark, black, terrifying time. But here's another misconception we have to get rid of right away. No one in the Middle Ages called it the Black Death. It was the Great Mortality, or the Great Pestilence, or even in some cases in England, Blue Sickness. But it was not called the Black Death until centuries after it initially spread through Europe, and later historians look back and try to write about it. In the next lecture, we'll get down to the details of plague's epidemiology how it was transmitted, and which form of plague, bubonic, septicemic, or pneumonic, offered the most or least suffering, the quickest death, or a slim possibility of survival. Side note here, if I ever time travel back to the Middle Ages, and I am so unfortunate as to contract plague, I would opt for septicemic, as it was usually pretty quick. But for now, I want to put those details aside and try to get a sense of the big picture of how the Black Death affected, changed, and completely remade medieval society. And in order to do that, we need to understand what the medieval world looked like on the eve of the plague. So let's try to get a snapshot of medieval Europe in the early 14th century. Let's say around 1340. All right, now obviously I'm going to have to oversimplify here quite a bit. Scandinavia is not exactly like England, is not the same as France or Italy or Germany in 1340. But we can use some broad strokes here and get a sense of how the medieval world was ordered. If you needed to shorthand it, you could do a whole lot worse than saying that most of the Europe of the Middle Ages was Christian, agrarian, and feudal. Let's take those terms in order. So, Christian. Here the important thing to recognize is that in the Middle Ages, there is no such thing as separation of church and state. Indeed, such a separation would be almost inconceivable if you tried to explain it to a 14th century person. The church owned more property than any other entity. The church was deeply intertwined with education at every level, especially at the universities. The church had many business, production, and trade interests. 
and the church was deeply engaged and concerned with the politics of the day. The passage of the year, the month, the week, the hours, all of this was ordered and marked by church rituals. Many people went to mass every day. Indeed, going to church then in the Middle Ages might be considered the equivalent of, say, brushing your teeth today. It was simply part of the daily routine. The tolling of church bells to call monks and nuns to prayers for matins or vespers or compline or prime or any of this seemingly endless set of prayer times would also structure the day for the community surrounding an abbey or chapel. The church festivals and feast days kept time with the passing of the seasons. Indeed, have you ever considered why Lent occurs when it does and why it is the kind of observance that it is? In other words, why do observant Christians fast or restrict their diets for six weeks right before the celebration of the resurrection on Easter? Well, those six weeks in most years would usually just happen to be the time when the storehouses were most empty as the spring crops were not yet ready for harvest. Meat might be in short supply because everybody is waiting for the ewes to deliver their spring lambs, so not much slaughtering is happening. In other words, the church helped make a virtue of necessity. Easter thus would become not just a celebration of the resurrection, but also a celebration of newly full granaries and fresh meat and the first vegetables ready to be pulled from the cottage garden. Which brings me to the second word I mentioned, agrarian. Before we had what we think of as the Middle Ages, there was the Roman Empire. Before it definitively ceased to exist in the fifth century, Rome had been a society that had both busy urban centers and farmland that fed its citizens. As Rome started to transform into the entities that we think of today as the countries of Western Europe, urban centers went into serious decline and the majority of the population turned to farming, in many cases, subsistence farming, as the dominant way of life. Here's what that might look like in practice in an English village in the 14th century. The houses, church, and trade shops would all be gathered together in a cluster that would be surrounded by plowland, what we call the open field system. Next to or behind each house would be the vegetable garden and maybe a space for small animals like chickens. The fields outside the village center tended to be long, thin strips. This was because most plows were pulled by oxen and was very hard to turn a team of oxen. So better to go as long as you could and turn as seldom as needed. The villagers might share the task of plowing each other's fields as they would harvesting. And when the crops were planted, the small children of the village might be set to the task of scaring away the birds that would want to eat the sown seeds before they had a chance to sprout. Villagers had to coordinate things like crop and field rotation to make sure that the earth was given a chance to lie fallow and rest. Surviving court documents of the period show fascinating glimpses of the kinds of disputes that were likely to arise. If one farmer harvested or plowed a little too far onto his neighbor's strip, or if one stubborn villager refused to give the same hours of labor to plowing and harvesting, or opted to plant cereal grains when rotation called for beans, and this was actually a key concern as planting beans would put nitrogen back into the soil and keep the earth, quote, in good heart. And of course, in addition to needing to work their own land, most peasants in the Middle Ages owed a certain number of days of agricultural service to the Lord. Which brings us to our third word, feudal. Now, there may be some of you listening or watching out there who gasped or did a spit take when I said feudal, because you're probably aware that there was a time when medievalists referred to the word feudal and its related word feudalism as, quote, the F word. 
Although for decades it had been used to describe medieval society, research in the last 20 years or so seems to indicate that it wasn't the case that medieval people actually used the word themselves. Indeed, it wasn't until the 17th century that the word came into common use. But like Black Death, it's a convenient shorthand to describe a society that was structured in terms of bonds of service, support, loyalty, protection, and hierarchy, which the medieval world definitely was. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means that, for example, you have a king. How does he get to stay king? He pledges to offer his support and protection to the nobles just below him in the social order. In return for the right to be granted lands and titles, the nobles then pledge their loyalty to the king and swear to fight for him in wars and the like. They are vassals, and the system in which they are participating is also called vassalage. Then those nobles have lower ranking men who pledge the same thing to them. So let's say the Earl of Chivalry is a vassal of the king and holds his titles and lands of the king, or in what is partly the origin of the word feudal, in fee from the king. Then someone else, Lord Knighthood, pledges himself to the Earl of Chivalry and he in turn gets certain rights and privileges for becoming that man's vassal. This goes on down the line until we get to the peasants, who have the right to work land and keep for themselves a portion of their crops they harvest as long as they give an agreed upon amount of the harvest or certain number of days of labor to their lord. In a feudal society, everybody is thus connected to everybody else along the lines of a pyramid structure. Additionally, medieval society was organized in terms of an idea known as the three estates model. According to this long entrenched philosophy, people were born into one of three social orders, those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. Those who fight, the nobles, were supposed to provide the protection to the rest of the social order. Those who pray, the clergy, priests, monks, nuns, etc., were supposed to be busying themselves with helping to save humanity from sin. Remember the point I made a moment ago about medieval society being Christian? And then, these first two orders were supposed to be supported by the labor of those who work, the peasants, who enjoyed the protection of the nobles in the earthly life and the prayers of the clergy to help them in the life to come. One was not supposed to aspire to move out of one's order. Indeed, in the 14th century poem, Piers Plowman, the title character chides a knight who says he is so eager to help out humanity, he'll start plowing a field if only someone will show him how. No, no, says Pierce, you're a knight. You're supposed to protect me. As long as you do your job, I'll do mine. In the sixth passus of this famous dream poem, Pierce says, Ich shall swinka and sweta and soa for us botha, and labora for thee while thou livest all the leaf time, in covenant that thou cape holy church and me selva, for wasters and wicked men that this world strive in and go haunt hard lecha to haras and to foxes, to boras and to bacchus, that breaketh a dune men a hedges, and fight by folk in us to call wild fool us, for they come and to me croft, me corn to de fula." End quote. In modern English, that's, I shall work and sweat and sow for us both and labor for you my whole lifetime, as long as you live, as long as you promise to protect Holy Church and me from wasters and wicked men that trouble the world. Also, that you go hunting often for hares and foxes, for boars and wild bucks that break down my hedges, and that you send out your falcons to cull the population of wild birds 
for they come to my farm to devour my grain." End quote. That passage demonstrates quite clearly the ideal of the three estates. People belong to the order to which they were born, and if society is going to function properly, then there's no moving outside one's estate. Now you may be wondering, how does someone become part of the second estate, those who pray? The answer, in 99% of the cases, is to be born into the first estate as a second son or younger daughter. You see, by the time we get to the 14th century, most nobles and high-ranking landholders had figured out that the only way to maintain a family heritage and power in terms of titles and lands and income was to practice primogeniture, in which the eldest son inherits everything. Dividing lands and titles equally among heirs usually meant that within a generation or two, there'd be a lot of cousins, each clinging desperately to a tiny parcel of land, fighting among themselves for position, and no one would really have anything worth fighting over. So second and third sons and younger daughters for whom there was no money or goods suitable for a dowry, they would become monks or nuns and live out their lives in what could be quite comfortable and sometimes somewhat worldly religious houses. So here's the part where I ask you to answer the question, what do you think the percentage breakdown of the three estates was? How many people in society fought how many prayed, how many worked. When I ask my undergraduates this, they hopefully suggest that it might have been something like 33% each, or maybe those who fought were 25%, those who prayed were another 25, and the workers were 50%. In reality, however, it was something like five, five, and 90%. So the majority of the members of medieval society were those who worked at the bottom to allow the top 10% to live off the fruits of their labor. And as you might imagine, in terms of literacy, that means that the few people who could read and the fewer still who could read and write were mostly concentrated in that 10% at the top of the social order. And one of the most frustrating things for a medievalist is that this means in practice that of the few documents that do survive from the period, almost none are focused on the concerns, loves, disputes, and quotidian matters that affected the great bulk of members of medieval society. Now this had begun to change a little by 1340 for a few reasons. One was the rise of a merchant class which was able to develop in part because of a population boom that occurred between 1000 and 1300. Over the course of those three centuries, the population of Europe doubled from about 75 million people to around 150 million. This was due to a few factors, one of which was a period of global warming called the Little Climatic Optimum or the Medieval Warm Period or the Medieval Climate Optimum and this increased the growing season. Another influence that allowed the population to increase was that several advances had been made in agricultural practices. But what this meant was that in the blink of an eye, relatively speaking, there was a sudden land crunch. With the practical doubling of the population in just three centuries, Pretty much all arable land that could be worked was brought under the plow. And with this land crunch, many people found themselves driven to the cities to find a way to make a living. And we have, for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire, urbanization on a significant scale in places like London, Paris, Rome, Florence, and Milan. An increase in trade and the movement of goods to and from far-flung locales served to create a new class that didn't quite fit into the three estates model. While the merchant class should technically belong to the 90% of those who work, 
the members of that class started to look a little more like the top 5%, the nobles, or those who fight. For one thing, a shrewd businessman could make enough money to dress himself and his family in clothes of the highest quality, clothes that might make others mistake him for a minor lord, and he might send his children to one of the schools that were now available perhaps for the practical purpose of learning math and reading in order for that child to participate successfully in the family business, but maybe because he aspired to more for his children. And indeed, for the first time, more was possible. William Langland, the author of the poem Pierce Plowman, from which I quoted before, appears to have been a cleric in minor orders. He may have attended one of the cathedral schools that by this time were educating not just members of the nobility, but also the children of well-to-do tradespeople of the period. Some people think Langland may have had his education at the Benedictine School in Malvern. And of course, there's Geoffrey Chaucer, not only the greatest English writer of the 14th century, but arguably the greatest writer of English, period. He was born in London around 1343 to a family of vintners who had been doing very well in the wine trade. His was clearly a nimble mind, I feel like I'm understating that, a nimble mind, and with a solid education under his belt, something that would have been unlikely for someone in his position 50 years earlier, he went on to make a successful career for himself in civil service. But as we'll see in a later lecture, it was the arrival of the Black Death that actually helped give him his first literary break and turn him into the father of English poetry. So that's a very broad picture of what life looked like in medieval Europe around 1340 on the eve of the Black Death. We have a society that is predominantly Christian, agrarian, and feudal. And again, I use that word for the sake of convenience as it combines the elements of loyalty, service, protection, and hierarchy into one handy term. Medieval society is also rigidly committed to the idea of the three estates, those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. The ideal, as expressed by Langland, is that everyone stays in their order, being the best knight or best monk or best farmer they can be. If all the members of society did that, then everything would run smoothly. This ideal was starting to come under a little bit of pressure, however, with the rise of the merchant classes, who in some cases had more money than some of the lesser nobles and could live better than they did. But this pressure didn't present a real crisis to the social order yet. Many historians, such as David Herlihy, have argued that without some sort of external factor coming into play, society in the Western world would have continued on more or less like this for a few more centuries. And thus, what we think of as the modern world, with its enlightenments and scientific discoveries and literary and artistic renaissances, that world would have been much longer in coming. In other words, the theory goes that as horrible as the Black Death was for those who lived through it, the world that rose from its ashes was a better world with more possibilities for those who had survived its horrors. For one thing, the rigid boundaries of the Three Estates idea would be blown to absolute smithereens in the aftermath of the plague. It seems an interesting little twist of history that the plague, in the opinion of most historians, moved westward along trade routes, and those merchants and tradesmen who had been so eager to move goods along those routes were the ones whose families benefited in the long term once the ravages of plague had abated. With up to half the population dead, the great nobles didn't have enough labor to work their lands. The peasants who had been tied to a particular land or manor found that they could walk down the road and offer their services to another nobleman who might, in his desperation to get the harvest in, be willing to pay a large cash wage. 
The nobles, rich in titles and land holdings, but cash poor, started to marry into the merchant class. The merchants, of course, were delighted to see their sons and daughters work their way up the social hierarchy. Indeed, Chaucer's granddaughter, Alice de la Pole, became the Duchess of Suffolk. When the first wave of plague had passed, it was a brave new world that emerged. The medieval world in 1340 and the medieval world in 1360 were two very different places. So what exactly was this great pestilence, this great mortality that so fundamentally altered Western medieval society and set it on track to become the world we live in today? Was the plague that ravaged the world in the 1340s the same as the 6th century plague of Justinian that had taken such a toll on the Byzantine Empire? And if so, where had it been hiding for some six centuries? Or was bubonic plague only part of the answer? What about theories that anthrax, cattle murin, tuberculosis, and other diseases were active players in the wave of death that visited the medieval world in the middle of the 14th century? Could the plague have actually come from space, hitching a ride on comets and meteorites? <laughs> 